Oh, oh. Now I feel like I'm really getting the aroma. Hey there, I'm Sola El Whaley, and this is Ancient Recipes with Sola. In each episode, we take a dish you may recognize and attempt to recreate one of the oldest versions of it to ever exist. So it's a little cooking, a little history, and a whole lot of me. What's not to love? In this episode, we are gonna make the most popular and most interesting condiment in ancient Rome, garum. Garum is basically a fermented fish sauce that they put on everything, like legit everything, meat, fish, vegetables, everything. I feel like when the ancient Romans tasted something that they thought was lame, they would be like, let's add honey or garum or both. And then they'd be like, voila. <laughs> voila. And since garum was most often used within dishes rather than on top, we're also gonna make an ancient Roman roast boar with a garum based sauce. I wish we had smell of vision today because the ancient recipes kitchen is going to get very, very fishy. But before we get started though, I wanted to reach out to someone who has a little more garum experience than me to just find out what we're getting ourselves into. You have been asking to see us together. So this morning I reached out to Max Miller from the YouTube series, Tasting History to get a little garum advice. Hello, Sola. Thank you so much for having me on. <laughs> Thanks for coming. I'm so glad we were able to work this out. And I'm yeah. super excited to pick your brain all about garum. So tell me, how did it smell? How did it go? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was potent. Um, you know, I mean, it smelled like boiled fish, oddly enough. What's funny, I found that, you know, when you bake like bread, the smell lingers for a couple hours. But when you boil fish, the smell lingers for weeks. It gets into the walls. Uh, it, was, it was pretty... Rough, it's the gift but, that keeps on giving, it. you know? I love that. <laughs> exactly. You did a lot of history on garum. What is the most interesting thing that you learned? For me, I thought the most interesting thing was how it was used by uh, physicians, that it was used as medicine for everything from, from dog bites to indigestion to gout, but it could also cause gout. It could also cause indigestion. No, you know, it was kind of all, all a little bit crazy. Um, if you had troubles with your stomach, then you were supposed to put it on snails, but it had to be an odd number of snails. It was also used as not only topical, but also as an injection. Uh, and back then, injection usually meant like an enema. Oh. So it had lots of uses. I do Whoa. not suggest you you trying that. Though. Wait, wait. People would keep, do a keep, garum keep enema? Yeah. I wasn't expecting that at all. Okay. <laughs> You know, I'm, sh I'm sure the patient wasn't either. <laughs> so what are the biggest differences between this quick garum that we're going to make and the long fermented one that was more common? Yeah, so really the point of garum was to impart sodium to, to a dish. <clears throat> That's its number one goal. And both of these will do that. But just as, you know, the difference between heavily boiled cabbage and something like sauerkraut, they're very, very different because you're gonna get that umami flavor with the, the fermented garum. It's a very different flavor, but you do get that sodium even with the quick garum. Uh, the Romans didn't really salt most of their foods. There, there are a few recipes where they add salt, but usually it's adding garum. Even into their desserts, they would add this garum as, as a way to, to kind of spice things uh -huh. up, but um, so that's the main difference, you know, no, none of that special umami flavor, which you'll probably miss. That's using cabbage to explain it is a really cool way because I love fermented cabbage, sauerkraut and kimchi, but boiled cabbage is just like farts. So yes, <laughs> they're fermented very, very fish, different. they're yes. very, very different things. So, um, what do you think we want to taste something that's close to garum alongside my quick garum? So what do you recommend? Colatura di Alici. You can still get it online. You can get it at a lot of stores. I know there's an Italy in New York where you are. Um, mm -hmm. Colatura di Alici is, is very similar to what we think. It's very similar to what they would have had in parts of southern Italy. Supposedly, the place that they make it mm -hmm. has been making it the same way for well over a thousand years. Oh, so wow. it, will have, okay. it will have that flavor. If you don't have that, though, you can also... Eastern fish sauces, mm -hmm. you know, it's still a very popular ingredient in the Far East. 
it's just going to be made with different amounts of salt and different uh, mm -hmm. other additives, but you're going to get the same idea. Colatura del lychee. You pronounce yes. it really well. I, I mean, I love Eastern fish sauces, but I've never really had a lot of experience with the Italian ones, so I'm also excited to see how different they are. Thanks, Max. We will definitely be keeping an eye out for whatever you dive into next. Thank you, Sola. If you want to see what Max is up to, head to the link in the description below and check out Tasting History with Max Miller. That was a great conversation with Max. It sounds like the Romans were really obsessed with this stuff, so I'm so excited to find out what all the hype is about and to try out Colatura de Lici, the garam of today. Okay, we're gonna make a quick garam recipe that was outlined in Geoponica. Geoponica is a manuscript that was compiled in the 10th century for the Byzantine emperor, Constantine VII. It's a compilation of writings all about agriculture and it has multiple authors, many of whom we don't even know today. So I'm really excited to get going. This isn't the true most popular type of garum. The most popular type of garum involved layering fish with a bunch of salt brine for a few months until the fish breaks down and ferments and then we strain off this liquid from it called liquamen. So this one, we're gonna simmer the fish for about 40 minutes in a very, very salty brine. So we're gonna go in by making the brine, which is gonna involve a lot of salt, like a lot. So in the recipe, they say to Add enough salt so that when you put an egg into it, it may float, it may swim. We're gonna make this egg swim by making a super salty brine. So I'm gonna add a little bit of salt at a time and then get in there and test it with my egg, see what happens. So under the ash in the city of Pompeii, there was this one part of town that was known for its garum making. Archaeologists decided to investigate and they found buried under the ash whole pickerels that were still in the process of breaking down. It's kind of incredible what we're able to learn because of that eruption. This feels like a lot of salt, so I'm gonna try my egg situation, see what happens. Are you ready to swim, little guy? Aww. Not yet. The most popular garum that most Roman recipes are using is fermented, so it's gonna have more funk. This is gonna be more salty and fishy. So we decided we're gonna make our boar sauce in two batches. We're gonna make one batch using this garum, the, this quick garum that I'm making right now, and another batch using Colatura de Alici. So I'm interested to see the difference. We're just gonna get a lot of salt here. Like when you let something ferment, it's gonna like, it's gonna get more acid, it's gonna get more funk, it's gonna have a lot of depth, umami. So this is probably just gonna be like funky fishiness. I love, love, love fish sauce. So I feel, I suspect I'm gonna like this. I know it's supposed to be stinky, but I feel hopeful. Okay. Yay! Do you think that's floating? I think that's floating. It is time to chop up our fish. Okay, you know what's crazy though? Check this out. I'm just like stirring this and immediately we're getting this like salt crust happening along the sides of the pot because it is just so much salt. Okay, so now that my brine is ready, I am going to cut up my mackerel. So here we have, this is like really good fish, guys. There's some extra fish that I'm gonna take home that I'm really excited about. We are gonna use the whole thing. This is not gutted because we want those guts. We want that intestine, we want that brain. All this is gonna add so much funk and flavor to our garum. I'm just gonna chop it up into like four pieces just so it breaks down a little bit faster for us. Oh, should I do like a dramatic chop? Yeah? Just a little chop and drop. Bye, fishy. Bye. Bye bye. Okay. You ready? No, <laughs> that's really bad. Sorry, guys. I'm not a. <laughs> I don't usually chop like that. You know? Hmm. Here we go. You go in here. You go in here. So the Roman author, Pliny the Elder, Ciao. he wrote in his The Natural History that garum is one of the most expensive liquids being sold outside of perfume. He also named a bunch of towns that are known for their garum making, including Cartia, Calzomene, Liptis, and Pompeii. But supposedly the best garum comes from Spain, doesn't everything? And they come in these really cool ancient looking vessels called amphora. Okay, fishy. Whoa, look at those guts. This is just what we want. 
So we got our fish and our brine. There you go. And now to this, I'm gonna add a little oregano. And now they said some people add sapa. We're gonna go for it. We're gonna add sapa. What sapa is, is a reduced grape must. So grape must is the stuff that you get before you make wine. So it's when you crush the whole grapes and stems and skins and everything and you get that juice before you ferment that into wine, that's grape must. So this is when you take that grape must and reduce it and it gets really syrupy and tart. It's almost a little bit like pomegranate vinegar, but maybe not so intense. So I hope that it kind of balances out all the fishy saltiness that's about to happen here. Now this is gonna simmer for about 40 minutes. Let me turn this up a bit. And I'm gonna, while it cooks, I'm just gonna occasionally get in here with my wooden spoon. We wanna break this up as much as possible. And then we're gonna let it cool completely and strain. And that's our garden. Okay, so this has been simmering away. I got in there, smushed it up a little. So a lot of the fish is broken down and the liquid is really darkly colored. I'll smell it. I don't think it's that bad. Maybe if we're making vats of it, but it just smells like, it just smells like right when you open up a can of sardines, that's it. You know, you get that fishy waft. It's nothing crazy, it's nothing unpleasant. I mean, if you don't like fish, you're not gonna like it, but I don't think it's bad. But okay, so it's gonna take a few strains. Max said that it took him a few goes to get it nice and clear. So I'm gonna do an initial strain just through a colander to get out all the big chunks. And we're gonna go through cheesecloth, then we're gonna go through linen. The goal is this is supposed to be like a really nice amber, clear liquid. The consomme of fish. Okay, here we go. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> ooh, ooh. Now I feel like I'm really getting the aroma. Now, after the first pass, we got all, all of our chunks, but there's still a lot going on in there. So strain number two. Whenever I'm straining for cheesecloth, I always give it a little bit of like a, a moisten, but it, it, it not only does it help like line whatever you're straining into, but when you're straining a liquid and the goal is you want the liquid, you want to start with a wet cheesecloth so, so that the cheesecloth doesn't sop away all of the, the liquid that you want. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? We don't, we don't want to lose all of our garden to the cheesecloth. I think I need a, a gift assist. GIF assist. Okay, definitely need another strain. Oh. All right. One more strain. Third strain. Okay. Now, through linen. If I wanted to be like modern, if I was making this for myself at home, I would use coffee filters. I think that would work really well, but I don't think they had coffee filters back then. So we're gonna go with some linen. It's getting clearer with every strain. You know, it started out really dark and murky and now after straining it out, it's more of like a golden honey color. I think it's beautiful. So the great thing with garum is not only does it add salt, but it adds moisture. Because if you just add salt to something, it usually is pulling the moisture away. So here, this is double duty. Seasoning and hydration. So now that my garum is strained, we're gonna make our boar sauce using some of this and our colatura del lechi. Because garum is tasted best in a dish. It's not really used on top of stuff, it's used in stuff. So here we go. Okay, we've strained the garum and now we're gonna prepare the sauce for the boar. Like I mentioned earlier, garum is most often used within recipes. So we pulled this recipe from the oldest cookbook from the traditional ancient time period, Apicius. According to Apicius, this sauce works on any meat. So we chose these beautiful boar shanks. So the beginning of this sauce is like a lot of the beginning of ancient recipes. We're gonna start with a little smash. Here, I've got some black peppercorns juniper berries, woo, celery seed, thyme. And you know what, I'm gonna give this a little smash before I keep going. 
Sometimes it's good to smash in batches. I find that you can get an even grind. Okay, let me add the roux. There goes our roux, a little bit of dried mint, and then here I have some lovage. Now lovage tastes a lot like celery, but like really a lot more intense. It's like a celery parsley combo. And you saw it a lot in ancient Roman and Greek cuisine, but you see it a lot nowadays too. It's coming back. It's making a comeback in all the fancy schmancy Italian restaurants. Apicius is still influencing them because that was written in like 4 AD. Okay, I feel like good initial smash in with our lovage. Woof, it is very intense, but I'm a fan. If you like celery, you'll like lovage. There is one ingredient that is in this recipe that we were not able to find, and that is fleabane, which um, is kind of hard to find these days. You know, it's crazy, these ancient ingredients. I'm surprised we find as many as we do. It's supposed to be kind of like a weed, so maybe we should try and grow some, one of us, whoever has a yard, for the next time it pops up in an ancient recipe. As I smash, I'm getting like waves of different herbs. Right now, the mint is hitting me. Okay, so nowadays, we usually use grams and ounces for measuring things, but back then, they would use scruples. A scruple is about one and a quarter gram. So these measurements were all very precise. It was like nine scruples of peppercorn, seven scruples of this, seven scruples of that. So this is like, it's kind of interesting with the ancient recipes. Sometimes it's like a no recipe recipe and sometimes they get real, real intense. So here I've got all my herbs and spices and they had very, very specific measurements. Then to this, we're gonna add, quote, a sufficient amount of honey. I don't, I, I don't understand, so, so specific. And then you're just leaving me alone leaving me on my own here to figure out the amount of honey. We're gonna add enough to try and make a consistent mixture without the honey overpowering it. I feel like I got, I got some good smash action here. We didn't even have to call gift for this one. Okay, now I'm gonna add my sufficient amount of honey and vinegar, and then we're gonna divide this up, add our homemade garum to one and colatura de alici to the other. So. Boom. Smells real herbaceous. It almost kind of actually smells like henna to me. I don't know why. Oh, okay. Now, our sufficient amount of honey. I think the honey is gonna be really important here because we've got a lot of pungent things happening. I think in my mind, when I read that recipe, a sufficient amount, I just want it to be like, almost bring it together and then let the vinegar take us the rest of the way. So I want this to be kind of a paste. Okay, yeah, I think that's sufficient. Should I vinegar it up? Is that cool for you? Eh, yeah, okay. There isn't a specific amount, but I just wanna get this to be like thick sauce consistency. I don't want it to be too thin. I don't want it to run right off the bore. I want it to be thick enough to stick to it, but then, you know, have enough moisture that it helps that bore get nice and tender. A little more. I mean, so far, I think this is gonna taste good because we got sweet, we got sour. We're gonna get salt from a fish sauce. We have nice, herbaceous, bitter spices and stuff like that. That's not to be good. Okay, I think that looks good. I'm gonna divvy this up so we can make two batches. Okay, evenly mixed. Now, I'm gonna split half of this into this bowl. Does that look like half? Boom. Now, I'm splitting up my sauce because my quick garum doesn't have the full umami flavor of that long fermented garum. So in this batch, I'm going to add my homemade quick garum that's got a lot of salt and a lot of fishiness. And to this batch, we're gonna add the colatura di alici, which is gonna give us a nice umami boost. There it goes. Okay, so let's mix this guy up. I am already smelling that colatura in here. And now let's mix this guy up. This is my 
home make garum. The aroma here hasn't changed. It's still just this mostly herbs. The real big strong thing that's coming through for me is the mint and the lovage. All right, and now I'm gonna coat each boar shank in our sauce, and then we're gonna pop these in our testa that we're gonna line with banana leaves and roast them until they're nice and tender. And then we're gonna get in there and give it a taste. All right, let's get them in the testa. Okay, we got our testums. Testum, testa, testa. Okay, so a testum is a kind of terracotta Roman portable oven. And they would use it by just, you, you put your meat in here. Sometimes they would even bake a cheesecake. They used it for everything. And then you nuzzle in some coals, pop it with this lid, and then put more coals on top. But today we're gonna use it almost like a Dutch oven and pop it in the oven. Now, the Romans did have banana leaves, but they're very rare. But we're gonna use them here today because we wanna make sure the meat doesn't stick to the bottom of the testum. Okay, so here is my garum covered boar. Let me get her in here. I want all that sauce. Whoa, look at that. Nice. Now, this is my colatura de lici sauce. So, there you go, buddy. Now, this is just gonna go in the oven and we're gonna roast it until the boar is nice and tender. I think it's gonna take a couple of hours. Shanks can be tough. So I'm gonna cover these up and we're gonna let them roast in the oven for about two to three hours. We wanna make sure the boar has time to get nice and tender. And then it's gonna be time to taste. Okay, we just took the boar out of the testum, but before I get to that, I wanna taste this garum on its own. Pliny the Elder, good old Pliny. Ciao. He said that you can drink garum on its own if you dilute it to the color of honey wine. So that's what I'm gonna do. I got my wine glass. I got my garum. Whoop. Okay. I know he said to dilute it, but I kind of wanna taste it undiluted first. Is that a horrible idea? I'm doing it. very, very salty. And that's really just it. There's a little bit of savoriness from the fish, but not a whole lot. It doesn't taste as fishy as it smells. It's mostly just, it's just like ocean water. Like, you know, when you're swimming and you just swallow a mouthful of sea, Very, very salty. I don't get any of that complex fermenty funk. It's just very salty with like the finish of, of, of fish. Okay, I need a palate cleanser real quick. Hold on. Ah, here we go. This is gonna make it all worth it. Okay, so this boar was the one that had colatura de alici, and this is the one with garum. I'm gonna start with the one that's coated in my homemade garum. And I feel like I gotta do this just with my hands, you know, like the Romans would. Oh, that's bone. <laughs> Let me go from this side. That's tough. Hold on. There we go. Mm -hmm. A lot of herbs, a little bit of fishiness maybe, but I think I need to try the other one to get a better idea of what's going on here. Uh, 
Can I have a napkin, please? <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. They are actually pretty different. For the boar that's coated in my homemade garam sauce, I get a lot more of the herbs. You know, I taste the rue, I taste the lovage, I taste the thyme. But in this one, there's like this depth to it that's definitely missing. You know, there's this umami, there's this like roasty toasty thing happening. So I do see that there is a big difference. This one, it just feels like it added salt. I barely even get the fish situation. I don't actually get fishiness in either, but here there's this like umami thing that's missing. So I do see the benefit of going for that long ferment, but both pretty good, not, not bad. It's very interesting how all of these herbs and spices come together. So would I make this again? Probably not. Garam is something I've wanted to make for a really long time. So it was a fun experience, but you know, some experiences are just good to have once. If you like this episode, you know what to do. Be sure to subscribe. And as always, if there's any ancient or vintage recipes you want to see me try out, let us know in the comments and I will see you next time. Arrivederci.